Thank you so much, ma'am, for such an elaborate uh, introduction. And I thank uh, Dr. Rajiv Chawla, sir, and Dr. Shalini for giving me an opportunity. It is an honor for me to participate in this uh, prestigious conference. And uh, also my deepest regard to Dr. Uh, Sasheya, sir, and regards to all other members of the Dipsy family. Is my slide visible, ma'am? Visible, audible. Okay, so I will proceed. I will be talking on a different subject today, PCOS to GDM. Is it inevitable? In our practice, we are getting so many patients with PCOS, starting right from adolescence till they are menopausal. So PCOS is the most common multi-system endocrinopathy, which is affecting the women of reproductive age group. PCOS in this PCOS, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the ovary, adrenals, liver, adipose tissue, and skin all are affected. And PCOS is the forerunner and maybe the earliest manifestation of continuation of GDM, diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, endometrial hyperplasia, and malignancy in later on uh, life. So the PCOS sets in the intrauterine life itself. Because of hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, and hyperandrogenemia, there is metabolic printing, imprinting, as Dr. Balaji had just told us, and children born with less than 2.5 kgs and more than 3.5 kgs are prone to develop GDM, uh, the PCOS, later on in life. During adolescence, or childhood, because of hyperinsulinemia, there is visceral obesity, there is adipose tissue dysfunction with premature adrenarchy and pubarchy with PCOS. And as the child grows, she presents with abnormal uterine bleeding, irregular cycles, and is not able to conceive. She presents with uh, in, uh, difficult to treat anovulatory infertility. And once she conceives, she has so many pregnancy-related complications. As she grows up, she is prone to develop type 2 diabetes, SAH, obesity, dyslipidemia. And uh, in old age and now in middle age, they develop C uh, CBD, endometrial cancer, and breast cancer. So uh, the Rotterdam criteria to diagnose PCOS includes any of these two, uh, three criteria: oligomenorrhea, clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenemia and ultrasonic picture of PCOS. So the PCOS society has divided the PCOS uh, manifestation into four uh, phenotypes. These are, first three are hyperandrogenic phenotypes and the last one is only oligoaminorrhea and uh, PCOS picture of ultrasound. So we wanted to see whether all the four PCOS phenotypes have endocrine and metabolic derangements. So we conducted this study in Lady Harding and we found that all phenotypes of PCOS had deranged endocrine and metabolic profile. And to add on to this, prevalence of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome was maximum in the complete phenotype, which had all the three criteria and on oligoevolution and uh, hyperandrogenic phenotype. Whereas the O plus P phenotype without hyperandrogenism had the least amount of metabolic derangements. Another thing which we see in the practice is, although most of the patients, about 70 to 75 percent of women are obese, but we also deal with lean PCOS. So we wanted to know whether there is any uh, clinical, hormonal and metabolic difference in relation to BMI. We conducted another study in Lady Harding and we found uh, we were very surprised to see that nearly 83% of lean PCOS had insulin resistance, although the insulin resistance was much more as expected, 93% in overweight. So among the clinical parameters, hirsutism, which we uh, objectively measured as ferriman galway scoring more than eight, irregular cycles, acanthosis, and acne, as you can see, was significantly more maximum in overweight followed by lean. But again, it was significantly more in both the groups as compared to the controls. In hormonal profile, FSH, 
test uh, TSH and prolactin were comparable on all the three groups, but LH and testosterone were significantly high in both the PCOS groups. Coming to the metabolic profile, the family history of diabetes, li deranged lipid profile, impaired GTT were significantly more in overweight, followed by lean, and they were negligible or minimal in the control group. Both fasting and two-hour post-glucose were normal in all the three groups. And postprandial uh, insulin, which you can see here, is 95. Mean level is 95 in overweight. It was 52 in uh, lean. And it was less than 40, which is the normal limit in the controls. So what I want to say is this is a common pathology, uh, pathophysiology for all the three conditions. The PCOS, which is also a pre-diabetic condition, which will further progress to GDM when the woman gets pregnant and later on to diabetes. We uh, studied the gene polymorphism, uh, which was associated with metabolic features in PCOS. And we found the same genes to be affected in GTM also. Again, some of the novel uh, biomarkers which are involved in energy and glucose metabolism and are implicated in pathophysiology are shared by all the three conditions. So we uh, conducted uh, this study to characterize, uh, to find out the association of misfatin 1 levels with metabolic and clinical parameters in PCOS. And what we found out was that nisfatin 1 levels were 10 times higher in PCOS subjects and correlated well with postprandial blood glucose levels. The same findings the Caucasians have reported in GDM and also in diabetes. Then coming to FETUNA, kispeptin, and copeptin, these three markers also we correlated with anthropometric parameters and cardiovascular risk indicators in women with and without PCOS. And we found these levels were raised in PCOS subjects with respect to both age and BMI match controls. And they also correlated well positively with carotid intima thickness, HbA1c, waist hip ratio, LH, testosterone, and total cholesterol. Same findings have been implicated in GTM. So now the question is how many of them are going to progress from PCOS to GTM? So this is a beautiful study. Uh, this is a, a systematic review and meta-analysis, which included 21 studies involving 4,841 women and uh, with PCOS and more than 11 lakh women with as controls. They found that the uh, odds ratio of developing GDM was 3.58 in women with PCOS. Another study to uh, share the same thoughts, association between PCOS and the risk of pregnancy complications, they found that the women with PCOS had a relative risk of 2.78 uh, uh, to develop GDM. Along with this, they also found that these women have a higher chance of, uh, when they compared to women without uh, taking metformin, they found that the rate of spontaneous abortions, preterm labor, GDM, pre-IH, pre-eclampsia, chronic hypertension, all the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and SGA, small for gestational age, were significantly higher in women with PCOS. And this is the latest international evidence-based guidelines of PCOS, uh, which were uh, uh, coming, uh, which came out in 2018. They say that Asians have five times higher risk of developing GTM. In medical complications, of course, impaired glucose tolerance, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, increased LDL and triglycerides, high BP, endometrial cancer, all these things are there. So PCOS has to be a multidisciplinary approach. There is no doubt to it. And lifestyle modification is the first line, which includes behavioral changes, diet exercise, and stress management. Besides this, we deal with menstrual irregularities, problems associated with hyperandrogenemia and infertility. And we find that metformin, which is one of the most commonly used insulin sensitizers, is effective to treat both the clinical uh, axis, the endocrine axis, and also the metabolic axis. Morbid obesity women have to go for anti-obesity drugs like sibutramine and Orlistat or for bariatric surgery. In the behavioral strategies, we need to make them set a goal, realistic goal. Do continuous self-monitoring. Stimulus has to be controlled. 
they have to solve the problem assertiveness training they have to be told to eat slowly and take small meals small portions reinforcing changes and prevention of relapse so the key for retention adherence and maintenance of healthy lifestyle is support and continuous measurement dietary intervention to reduce the weight and reach ideal bmi because it has been seen that even if a weight reduction of 2 to 5% occurs it improves the uh, clinical and metabolic axis exercise intervention it has been talked about uh, since the beginning of the program 150 minute per week of moderate exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise and two times resistance exercise for adolescents one hour of moderate to vigorous exercise and muscle strengthening three times a week even leisure time physical activities are very important and ideally they should cover 10000 steps every day physical activity has to be tracked down and monitored by fitness tracking devices the goals have to be smart which means specific measurable achievable relevant and time limited even bouts of 10 minutes of progressively increasing 5% every week is important now comes the main stay of the treatment of pcos it is a bigonide in front of the august gathering i don't need to talk much about uh, metformin it acts by reducing insulin resistance reducing androgen hyperandrogenemia and suppresses gluconeogenesis it improves uh, inflammatory markers and vascular endothelial defects maximum dose is 2 grams but do we start metformin in all women of pcos no we generally do a ogtt and if the woman has impaired fasting or glucose tolerance impaired glucose tolerance or deranged homa ir or fasting insulin more than 24 or two hour uh, insulin post 75 gram glucose more than 40 or we have surrogate markers like bmi more than 23 waist hip ratio more than 0.8 having acanthosis family history of diabetes previous history of gdm macrosomia shoulder dystocia or sudden stillbirth we start them on metformin and i found that this 2 hour post glucose insulin level was particularly useful to uh, 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 to mark insulin resistance because it showed a good correlation with area under the curve of glucose insulin and insulogenic index therefore it is a very useful test to titrate the dose of insulin uh, of metformin we also studied the effect of metformin after 6 months of therapy in pcos women and we found that there was a significant reduction in insulin resistance lh total testosterone bmi reduced significantly and many of our patients started getting regular cycles these are the details which i am not going to elaborate then comes the effect of metformin on pregnancy outcome so here we have this very important meta analysis where they studied the effect of metformin on pregnancy outcome in women with pcos this included 13 studies out of which four were five for uh, rcts what they recommend is that metformin treatment in women with pcos throughout pregnancy not just first trimester or second trimester could increase the possibility of term delivery reduce the chances of uh, early pre, uh, premature labor preterm labor pregnancy complications like gdm and pih with no serious side effect moreover metformin was not associated with any teratogenic effects and they recommend that metformin use should be used in pcos women throughout the pregnancy however ADA says that metformin in women with PCOS should be discontinued after first trimester. This is another lovely study. Can metformin reduce the incidence of GDM in pregnant women with PCOS? Again, they showed that there was a statistically significant reduction in the incidence of GDM and preeclampsia in those women where metformin was given continuously. Another very recent study, a systematic review and meta-analysis. about effect of metformin on pregnancy outcome metabolic profile and sex hormone in pcos women they this included 18 studies and again in the women who continued metformin they had a significantly reduc- uh, reduction rate of preterm delivery pih preeclampsia macrosomia and homa ir values dr sunil sir has already told us the good news in uh, february 2022 this is the first regulatory body which has recommended that glucophage 
may be approved as a first oral antidiabetic medication to be used continuously during pregnancy from conception till birth on the basis of the Merck's own safety cohort study, flu study. So the evidence till date, uh, MOHFW, the government of India and NICE guideline recommend both insulin and metformin as first line. DIPC also recommends both to be used in pregnancy. Australian guidelines do not recommend use of uh, metformin in pregnancy. And ADA and ACOG both recommend that insulin is the first line, but if the woman is not ready to take insulin, metformin should be used as the second line. Uh, although we need to tell them that the long-term safety is not well established and it crosses the placenta. The other things, uh, uh, molecules which we are using as insulin sensitizers are n cysteine, which is a derivative of amino acid L-cysteine and is used as a mycolytic. 600 milligram, eight, uh, eight hourly is the dose. And it is uh, a very good agent as an insulin sensitizer. It has anti-apoptetic activity, antioxidant, preserves vascular integrity, and has been shown to have anti-cytokine effect. Inositol is another molecule which belongs to B-complex vitamin types. And again, it is being used in women with PCOS as an insulin sensitizer. Now, progression of GTM2 diabetes, we can see as a continuum, the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus after gestational diabetes. This is a uh, very nice uh, study, including 1,809 publications, and it includes more than 28 lakh women. What they found was that 78,893 developed type 2 diabetes at six weeks or later after delivery, and the uh, relative unadjusted relative risk of developing diabetes was 8.2. Nine Another study, metformin. Uh, this is a very important uh, uh, finding. Metformin reduced the incidence of type 2 diabetes by 31% compared to placebo after an average follow-up of 2.3 years and by 18% over 10 to 15 years after randomization. And another study says that the subgroups which are most benefited were the subjects who had obesity, high baseline fasting glucose, or H high HbA1c, uh, or women with GTM. Of course, PCOS women will also come in this. So to conclude, the comprehensive management of PCOS requires a timely diagnosis of PCOS for initiation of appropriate treatment. A multidisciplinary approach has to be taken. Because these patients are going to go to physicians, dietitians, dermatologists, obs and gynae people, uh, and physical instructors. They are going to go to the gymnasiums. So everyone has to be taken on board. It has to be a patient-centered lifestyle management as the first line. And role of metformin is now proven. It improves the clinical endocrine and metabolic features and also helps in delaying, if not preventing, the uh, progression to GDM, diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. Optimization of health of women of PCOS before conception, as Sir says, may be an important uh, milestone in preventing disease, a transmission of disease in the next generation and reducing intergenerational transmission of disease. So we need to catch them young. And th I thank you all for a very patient hearing.